have, um, they've just had to be themselves at home with their children. We're here to provide care and we can't do that. So please uh, keep everybody in your thoughts as they're trying to adjust to all those things as well. Now, how can we be thankful and grateful? Well, we can be because we have a God who's above all of this stuff and a God who brings us together, calls us to worship, and is deserving of our worship because he is our God and we are his people. So as we come and hear the prelude, let our hearts be still, prepared, and ready to rejoice and be glad in the God who has given us this day. I don't know what this is saying something. You know, if there's something printed on the screen, I don't know what. God is with us. God is in this place. We are here to give him his praise and his due and his thanks. So invite us Just all to us a meeting take our hymns or look at the screens, either way. But we're going to sing together and now. Thank we all our God. And uh, turn to that and let us sing. Hymn number 14, please rise.
An attitude of gratitude is difficult. We all know that is sometimes a difficult thing to sustain. And when there is no gratitude, or it's kind of limited, it seems that along comes all sorts of other feelings and all sorts of other things, like resentments and bitternesses and grudges and other things that are not becoming of one trying to follow Christ. So in this time where we are very mindful of our thanks and perhaps our lack of it, let us turn to God and confess our need for him, confess our sinfulness, confess our lack of gratitude, and bring ourselves to him. Let us pray. For your mercy, for your forgiveness, for your compassion and your kindness, for removing any deserved anger toward us and replacing it with grace. We thank you today, O oh God. Instill in us a growing, renewing, attitude of gratitude, thankfulness in our hearts, and rejoicing with our lives. Let it not be limited to one day in the year, but may it expand to each moment of each day. To you we come, humbled, ready, in Jesus' name. Amen. And it is in Jesus' name I can assure us of the grace of God, shown to us, promised to us, and assured for us in the gift of Jesus Christ, his Son, who gave of himself that we might know what life, love, and a reason for thanks truly is. Receive what you've been given this day, this moment, for all time. Thanks be to God. With him there is a peace. Take a moment and pass that peace to those who are worshiping around you. You can unmute yourselves on Zoom and share it with each other as well. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you all. 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 As I said, we're glad to have our handbell folks with us today, and we look forward to them speaking to our hearts with the music that they have been blessed to share.
Thank you all so much for, again, taking some time to learn that and present it and share it with us today. Well, Finn and Rowan, you want to come up? Do you have the mic? Bob, you have the mic. I'm going to move this in front so these folks can hear. Oh, it's over there. Trying to keep the mic to yourself. things going? Good. Very good. See, we haven't heard your voice for a long time. So it's nice to hear you, Tim. Good to see you, Rowan. How are things going? Good. Life going well? All right. Very good. So, I would say if things are going pretty good, that means usually we can be pretty thankful, right? Right? What is Thursday? Thanksgiving? So what are you guys looking forward to in Thanksgiving? Rowan, what do you look forward to about Thanksgiving? Visiting your family. Finn, what do you look forward to on Thanksgiving? I'm eating turkey. Eating turkey. See, now that's much better than family, really, when it comes down to it, isn't it? No, that's good. So you're thankful for the turkey, you're thankful for the family, right? Now, I have a question. What else are you thankful for? Not on Thanksgiving, anytime. Tell me something else that you are thankful for, Finn. Very good. Thankful for your family. Well, what else are you thankful for? Nothing. Your family? You said that up there. Something else. Okay. Anything else? Nothing. All right. Very good. So we can think of things that we are thankful for, and we don't have to wait until Thanksgiving, do we? No. We don't have to wait till one day of the year. We should be doing that every day. You should be thankful for your family today and tomorrow and the next day, right the next day. And if you don't get turkey to eat today, you're gonna get some food to eat today, you should be thankful for it, right? Absolutely. We should always be thinking about being thankful because God is always with us too. And God does not let us go. He loves us. And there's nothing better to be thankful for than that, okay? So I want you to remember every day, Mr. Finn and Ms. Rowan, to be thankful, okay? Even if there's not turkey, there's gonna be something. Even if you don't get to see your friends, there's gonna be something. Maybe you can be thankful for her, are you? For your sister? And you for your brother? Just depends on the moment, right? Okay. But I'm thankful both of you guys are with us, okay? So let's, before we go off, let's thank God one more time, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you care for us. We thank you for all that you give us, especially not just the things like the food, but the people, our family, our friends, our church, and Jesus. Help us to always be thankful, no matter what the day is. And may you bless your own and faith with a grateful heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you are going to follow, I believe, Miss Dina. Apparently, Miss Becky. I don't know. There's two of you, both of you. I'm not sure what's going on there. We'll regroup here a second. So I'm going to invite Ed to come forward, and Ed's going to uh, share with us our scripture readings for the day. First, excuse me, our first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 105. I give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. 
Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever, of the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Our next lesson is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. You will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known to all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And our next reading is for, from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with your ministry. Here ends the reading for this morning's hour. Thank you. Is that the day? Is that the day? Or is this that day? Excuse me. Is this that day? Is uh, a reference to the very first verse in Isaiah chapter 12 that Ed just read. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. So is this that day? That's my question. That's what I want us to think about today. There is a, a typical pattern that occurs in scripture, especially in Isaiah the prophet, when he brings up this phrase, in that day. The phrase, in that day, appears at least 43 times in the first half of the book of Isaiah, which is 61 chapters long. So for the most part, in the first 30 chapters of Isaiah, you will hear read at least 43 times the phrase, in that day. And most of the time when you see that phrase, there's a particular kind of pattern to what is being stated. And basically it is this, that God says through Isaiah that in that day, Whatever securities his people, in this case the Israelites, but in all cases, anyone who identifies themselves as part of God's people, the things, the securities that people rely upon other than God, those securities are going to fall. They are going to be broken. They are going to be dismantled so that God can be put back into God's proper place so that God's people will, will be humbled and God will again be exalted. Because you see, there's this ongoing cyclical pattern that occurs with us in our relationship with God and as human beings. It's sort of shown later in chapter 12 of Isaiah. This is the first verse, you will say that in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. But then later it says, the haughty eyes of people shall be brought low and the pride of everyone shall be humbled 
and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up and high. That says Isaiah 2, it's actually Isaiah 12. So there's the pattern. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. The pattern becomes this, that for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. So what happens on that day or in that day, according to God, is that God is going to indeed have moments of anger with his people, but that anger is going to turn. The pattern is this, that God's people angered him. This happened in Isaiah's day, it happened in Jeremiah's day, it happened in Ezekiel's day, Micah's day, Daniel's day, all the prophets' days. It happened in Jesus' day, it happened in Paul's day, it happened in our day, it happens in our life, in our moments. We do things that rightly would anger a just and a righteous and a holy God. In those first half chapters of Isaiah, we find that the people anger God in a variety of ways that we still are all guilty of. There was idolatry, where the people lifted something or someone up above God, paid more attention to something or someone else, sought the advice or the, the guidance of something or someone other than God. That's idolatry. We don't use that, much, that word much in the 21st century, but we use that concept quite frequently. There is also that they were trusting in others than God, trusting in, not just lifting up, but trusting. They were trusting in other nations. They were trusting in other kings. They were trusting, it says, in chariots. In other words, in their weaponry, in their armory. They were, they were trusting in, in their own insights. They were trusting in their own strength. They were trusting in their gold and their silver. They were trusting in things other than God, which created a frustration, an anger from a God who had a covenant with these people and has a covenant with us, a covenant of love and of reverence and of holding God in a position of great and highest honor. They also stopped caring for the widows and the orphans and the dispossessed. They had not been caring for the needy. They had not been demonstrating the kind of compassion and love and mercy that God himself taught them and showed them by taking them out of the land of Egypt into their own new land of goodness. When they started getting fat and eating the fat of the land and eating all they wanted, they forgot about each other and they specifically forgot about the people in need, the poor, who God also specifically said, you need to take care of. That does not make God happy when we forget the least among us. And then we also learn that God was angered because the people had stopped believing God as being present, as being attentive to them. Oftentimes in Isaiah, and I believe also in Jeremiah and some of the other prophets, it's noted how the people are saying, where is your God? Where is our God? Basically saying, we haven't seen anything from God for a long time. What's God done for us lately? So when they had the attitude that God's not present and God's not real, that's very troubling to God. So God's people angered God. Then we learn that God leaves God's people to the consequences of their idolatry and the consequences of not trusting in him and the consequences of not taking care of the needy around them and the consequences of not believing God is present. Those consequences were, at least in, in the ancient thinking and in Isaiah's time, the consequences were that the people of Israel were experiencing things like famine, and other natural disasters. 
They were experiencing the takeover from the Assyrians and the Babylonians. In other words, they were experiencing outward conflict on them. They were experiencing internal fighting and internal turmoil. They were experiencing infrastructure problems. It's a big word today, isn't it? Infrastructure. Their infrastructure problems, it might not be that their bridges were falling apart, but what was happening is their poor people were not being taken care of. God let them to those consequences. God's a big God, God's a great God. God can alleviate whatever God wants to alleviate. But in God's anger and frustration that the covenant with God's people have been broken, God says, I'm gonna leave you to the consequences. That's part of the pattern. And then God's anger turns away. God's anger turns away. It's not because you and I, it's not because the Israelites do some wonderful job of repenting and recanting and fixing up their lives. The word turned away here actually means it came back to God. God's anger went out, but then it came back. And God took it back in to himself. And with that turning away of the anger, God comforted his people. God had mercy on his people. God forgave his people. God had grace upon his people. God demonstrated love to his people who had angered him with idolatry and unfaithfulness to one another and not believing in God and not trusting God. God said, I'm going to continue to trust you and love you. And then what happens in the, in the pattern? is God's people recommit and reposition themselves before God. They put themselves back into a right position with God. But as I said earlier, this is a cycle. Once they get themselves back in the right position with God, guess what? They pick up the idols again. They stop caring about the needy among them. They start trusting in uh, the king of Egypt instead of the God of the universe. It all happens again. And this pattern and this cycle didn't stop with God's people in Israel. It didn't stop with the Bible and Isaiah 500 years before Jesus. It continued and continues today. We are part of that pattern. So, so how, do we, how do we stop the pattern? Or how do we alter that pattern? How can we remain committed and properly positioned before God so that we, we don't continue to choose idolatry in our own way and to start trusting other people and other things and, 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 and not pay attention to God's presence among us and not pay attention to the needs around us? How can we get off of that cycle? What are we are told here? What will get us out of the cycle? I will give thanks. I will give thanks to you, O Lord. The giving of thanks is what starts to get us out of the pattern. You will say in that day, thank you, Lord. You will say in that day when you discover you're in this pattern, when you discover yet again God has had mercy upon you and God has forgiven you and God comforts you and God loves you, you will again say, thank you. But why wait till God needs to comfort us? Why wait till we need to feel like we're forgiven by God? The way to get out of the pattern is to begin to thank God all the time. Theologian Walter Brueggemann said, Thanksgiving is a contradiction of the values of a market economy that imagines we are self-made and can be self-sufficient. In other words, Thanksgiving is where we say, not that we could do it, but that God has done it. Thanksgiving is where we say, it's not about me, it's not something I've done, it's not me, it's someone else. Whenever you say thank you, you're acknowledging someone else besides you. Think about that. 
When we say thank you, we are acknowledging someone else. The Psalms make this clear. Ed read the 105th Psalm. We didn't have it up on the screen. Kelsey was frantically trying to find it. I think it was not there, but hopefully you listened. But the very first verse of the Psalm 105 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the people. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make his deeds known among the people. And that kind of attitude is all throughout the Psalms. I will give to the Lord the thanks due his righteousness and sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O oh Lord, for it is good. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God and I will extol you. I just quoted from six different Psalms there. Thanksgiving helps to get us out of the pattern. Thanks is when you recognize that you have received something. We say thank you for a lot of things. And with those different things, there come different emotions, different kind of sentiments. Same words, thank you. Someone holds a door for you, you say thank you. Out of politeness, out of being cordial, out of acknowledging that you have received an expression of politeness as someone has held the door for you. We might say thank you when someone has spoken to us and given us a word of advice or tried to give us some information. We might say thank you, sometimes with appreciation. Sometimes thank you becomes a, a word of dismissiveness. Like when you're tired of hearing somebody say something, you say, okay, well, thank you, as you're moving away, thank you. We mean that differently than we mean thank you to the person who held the door for us. And we mean both of those differently than to the person that we receive a gift that we really like, like from. You know, I really like this gift. Thank you for what, what you've given me. Or thank you that you gave it to me. It's an expression of, of gratitude, an expression of affection, either for what's been received or to the person from whom you've received it. Thank you keeps us acknowledging that we are recipients of something, that it's not just us. And again, we are recipients of God's turned away anger and comfort, God's mercy, God's compassion, God's forgiveness, God's love. Gratitude, someone said, is the experience that in Christ I have and am enough. I have received what I need from God. Thank you. And in order to get out of the pattern, it's important that we acknowledge this beyond occasionally. I'm reminded of probably one of my top three favorite verses in scripture from another prophet, Jeremiah. And I've read it many times here in different sermons. But I go back to Lamentations chapter three, where Isaiah says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies, his comfort, his turned away anger, is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Every morning, we are the recipients of God's comfort, of God's turned away anger, of God's mercy. It's been said that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who wake up in the morning and say, good morning, Lord. And there are those who wake up in the morning and say, good Lord, it's morning. Which are you? Because there's another part to this whole thing. That other part is this. You will say, 
in that day. Thank you, Lord. In that day. What day are you waiting for to say thank you to God? What day are you waiting for to say thanks? I've, I know I've made this point in different sermons as well, but we have lost our sense of present. We pretty much, we meaning just our contemporary humans, we are pretty much preoccupied with either memory or expectation. We spend much of our time either thinking about what was or what we hope to be. We are overwhelmed with the if onlys I hadn't or if only I had, the regrets and the what if this happens, the fears, the anxieties, the unknowns. We do not live in the now because we really don't give ourselves a now. We really don't give ourselves a present experience in this world. We think a lot about what could be, and we fail to recognize that whatever happens in the future, eventually we'll become a now. But we're better off starting to address the now that's right in front of us than concerning ourselves with a now that is yet to come and may never come. Is this that day for you? Right now, is this a day to give thanks to God? When it comes to time, someone made a point that I think is fascinating. God is only ever in the now. If you go back to the story of God and Moses and the burning bush, and Moses says to God, what's your name? And God says, my name is, I am. Remember that? Remember reading that? Or hearing, hearing it in the Ten Commandments and the movies? I am. Now go back to your days in English grammar. I am, present tense. God does not say, say I was, God does not say I will be, God says I am. Because as it says in scripture with God, a thousand years are like a day and a day is like a thousand years. To God there is only the now. Right now is where God is. Right now is what matters to God. As Paul said it, and Ed read it from 2 Corinthians, for he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. Today, as they say, is the first day in your life. It has never been before, and it will never be again this day. You live your life, your life, in days. Think about that. You live your life in days. How we live our days is how we live our lives. This day, right now, is a day to give thanks, to get out of the pattern. Catholic worker Dorothy Day said, we must live this life now Death changes nothing. If we do not learn to enjoy God now, we never will. If we do not learn to praise him and thank him and rejoice in him now, we never will. What day are you waiting for to say thanks? I'll give you an exercise if you want some homework. Easy exercise. Maybe not as easy as it, as it could be and should be. But I think this is an exercise to begin to get ourselves out of the pattern and into a daily thank you to God. This day, today, tonight, when you lay down your head, think of five things you're thankful for. And thank God. And then tomorrow, if you are blessed with one, 
before you get out of that bed and the alarm clock woke you, five things that you're thankful for. And then when you go to bed, five things that you're thankful for. And when you get up, five things that you're thankful for. As someone has said, if you hold up your head with a smile on your face and are truly thankful, you're blessed because of the majority of us can do that, but most of us don't. So again, is this that day? That day that you will say, I will give thanks to the Lord. I will give thanks to you, O Lord. Don't wait till Thursday, as I told Rowan and Finn. This is the day that God has made. This is the day of our salvation. This is the now, and God is the I am that is right here, right now. Above all idols, worthy of our trust, present with us, calling us to one another, including the least of these. So get out of the pattern and thank the Lord. Let us thank him. Let's pray. Holy God, you are indeed holy. You are worthy of all praise. You are beyond our thought and imagination, and yet you have made yourself real to us and known to us in Jesus Christ. So we know that you are a God who will not remain angry despite us, and every effort we make to get you mad, you will not turn to that anger, but you will reel it back in and have done so by showing us Christ, the ultimate reeling back in of your anger, so that we may know ultimately you are a God of love and compassion, comfort and forgiveness, mercy and grace. We thank you. We thank you that as Jesus told us, you, God, will never leave us nor forsake us. As we have been told, you are with us through the thick and the thin. So help us to thank you, to not wait to a better day, to not wait till the smoke clears or not wait until the fire starts burning and the challenges come. Instead, help us to be thankful now. Even in the midst of our sorrow and grief, remind us of the reasons for gratitude. We come alongside Brenda and Linda in their time of grief and lift them up before you and may we find reasons for gratitude and thanks in the service and the, the, the care that Alan provided in the, the, the church and in this body of Christ here. We thank you that you are bringing around them, Brenda and Linda, signs of your love. And may we as a church be part of that. We thank you for signs of recovery and recuperating for, for Tracy as she's in that period right now and ask that it will continue. We, we pray, Lord, that there will be reason for thanks and, and just of your power, seeing your power and your, your hand of healing and care upon Beth as she's recuperating from this, this accident. And continuing to be with Patty and Mike in their ongoing strengthening of their bodies. And we pray as well for Darlene, who's, who's been having troubles and is not with us this morning. We lift her up before you, that you might strengthen her body. We're thankful for Alyssa to be here today with us through all that she's been through. May you put in her heart your presence in a way that just shows her your power. And we thank you for Kelsey and Zach and the new life you're bringing them together in. May they too know reasons for gratitude. Let us not reserve this thanks for Thursday, but again this day. Know that we are in the presence of you, a God who is here right now, this moment, and each moment to come. 
May you bless your church here at St. John's that we might continue to be a presence of gratitude and give people reasons to be grateful as we seek to serve you in this community. To you we come. To you we've offered our worship this morning. To you we give our thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, praying together his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us now to the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to stand if you're here, turn in your hymnals, or go to the screen, hymn number 726, as we close. We praise you, O God. As we go, we go dedicating all that we've given today in worship, all that we give in our service to the Lord. Check out that table full of opportunities. All that we've done as people of prayer and people of care and compassion, we bring all that and take all that as we go forth. Let our lives be a life of gratitude and thanks. Let this day be a day like no other of lifting up the Lord with the lives we lead. Go forth as we give it all from our tithes and our offerings and ourselves and our being to the Lord who goes before us, beside us, and behind us. Amen. You may be seated.
Bye, Caitlin. Bye, Grammy. I'm Bye. cooking. I'm gonna cook your Swiss chicken. Oh, good. You can't it. I'm fine. You gonna make it? Or yes. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> oh, well, it'll be that's good. That's what Dr. Lester said to me. Nine it'll be good. I never wrote it down, and the nurse didn't write it down. <laughs> I will find that. If I don't hear from them, I will call. Well, yeah, maybe. I can find some too somewhere. Where did you get them somewhere or you just had them left over? What it might be nice to get two more I don't know. You know, when they'll be back, but 